Welcome to the Did Nothing Wrong podcast, where we try to cut through the noise and help you make sense of the chaotic information space around us. I'm Griff Somke. And I'm Jay McKenzie. On this episode of the Did Nothing Wrong podcast, we're joined by Robert Silverman to discuss the right-wing outrage machine's latest victim, the Target Corporation. Their crime? Selling pride-themed merchandise. We'll talk about what happened and what others who find themselves in the same situation can do to fight back. If you like what you're hearing, please give us a rating and a review on the app that you're listening on. Be sure to subscribe at didnothingwrongpod.com to get our content straight into your inbox. All of our work is free, but we're extremely grateful for paid subscriptions and donations that ensure that we can keep doing this important work. Thank you. Before we get started, just a quick bit of housekeeping. We're doing a survey to see what you'd like more of on the Did Nothing Wrong pod, and we're giving out stickers if you respond. We'll also be drawing three names at random for your choice of a free shirt or a coffee mug. Just go to our website at didnothingwrongpod.com and look for the survey tab at the top. It's that easy. Thanks again for your support, and now, on with the show. So, Target is the latest target of right-wing anti-trans outrage. They are very, very, very upset with the Target Corporation. June is Pride Month. Target sold what some people called some tuck-friendly swimwear in their stores. The right, always looking for a way to really look to gin up their people, got started on this. They claimed they were selling clothing with satanic imagery. And and they're not. No. They're not. It's been fact-checked, and they're not. And they also claimed that the tuck-friendly swimwear was being sold to children, and it is not. But this is these are the things that are being sold to the right-wing audience, and they believe it. I believe one of the videos, a woman seemed to grab the pride swimwear from the adult section and was standing in the kids section. So it looked <laughs> like it was, of course, yeah, they were selling it to kids. And then of course it's on TikTok, and then it blows up and then that's the story. And then Babylon B had some tweet about satanic trans babies and now target is canceling them and they won't let them shop there. And <laughs> again, one, one joke, but isn't Babylon B a satire site? I was always under the impression that that was their whole gig was satire. So they're what doing legitimate political commentary on this kind of stuff now? How's this work? Well, I think they've they've taken up that mantra of if it's not true, then it's a joke, and if it is true, then it's reporting. Amazing. It's the John Stewart clown nose on, clown nose off paradigm. We'll get it. <laughs> we can we can have a longer conversation uh, about how John Stewart and the Daily Show kind of did a disservice to activism for about a decade. Another time. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah. I, I mean, I've seen essentially the right talking about him doing that and how they should copy it. Mm -hmm. And they did. They did. There was a wonderful article. I mean, OK, now we are talking about it. There was a wonderful article. I forget who wrote it. And I think it was GQ. I'll find it and I'll dig it up. We'll throw it into the into the page listing. But there's an article about how talking about going back to that seminal uh, episode of Tucker Carlson and Paul Pagala, where, where John Stewart just dragged the two of them over the coals. Right. And that what Stewart was doing was saying that what the, this sort of false notion that there is a, a perfect midpoint of balance between every political debate and that engaging in these, you know, dumb wrestling matches between the left and the right taught no one anything. And it was just entertainment and that you know, they should stop. And Stewart, you know, from there was vaulted into a very active political figure for a lot of people on the left. And that oh, yeah. what happened actually is that John is that Tucker Carlson copied what John Stewart was doing and does it, I wouldn't say better than him, but certainly as effectively and mm -hmm. probably for uh, as big an audience as he is. And if you're talking about actual legislation that gets enacted or a yes. political movement that gets activated by what and comparing Stewart and Carlson, it's not even close. No. Tucker has a whole lot less competition in the space than yeah, John Stewart Yeah, they stole our stuff, man. Yep. That, well, that's what they do. It's just yeah. what they do. Well, and even uh, now we're going, if we go back to Target, one of the key points of Matt Walsh's screed yesterday that I listened to, and you know, please, please keep me in your thoughts and prayers, but I did <laughs> listen to it, and he, he was talking about how this 
was already pretty much diagrammed. This attack plan was diagrammed in Saul Alinsky's Rules for Radicals. Uh And what the right is doing is essentially copying that, which is, of course, funny because back when Obama first got elected, they loved to to trot that one out. Trot out Alinsky as Uh being one of their many boogeymen. If you were watching Glenn Beck during the early Obama years, and I'm going to I'm raising my hand, even though you can't see it right now. (laughs) Yep. If you're watching Glenn Beck, you know, the Cloward and Piven strategy was something that he mentioned <laughs> constantly, mentioning these two obscure academics who we're talking about again. And fact check me audience if I'm wrong on this, but he was mentioning of like that the you know was to slowly and surely uh infiltrate institutions and and push the policies that they're going to their extreme endpoint to therefore show how those policies were necessarily wrongheaded or or insufficient to the needs they were meant to address. But Saul Linsky was a huge boogeyman on the right circa 2009, 2011. Oh, absolutely. You couldn't get away from that. They would bring that guy up in every single conversation you'd have with him. Well, this is just rules for radicals. It's like, yeah. oh boy, yes. It's cool. a good book. Mm-hmm. They should read it. He jokingly dedicated it to Satan, of course, but they're going to leave that part out. (laughs) (laughs) But it's so typical that, you know, these people have a thing for absolutely telegraphing what they're going to do. They'll say, yes, this is how we're going to run this new thing. And there's just this amazing lack of skepticism on the part of some parts of the media for this. They they know it's there yet. For some reason, they're acting like this is some kind of grassroots thing. And it's just really disgusting. And Target's not helping themselves or they immediately back down, Mm -hmm. just immediately gave in back down. Oh, they're they're threats to our workers, which they don't care about their workers. This is Target. (laughs) They (laughs) They care about their stock price. They care. They've seen this incessant attack on Bud Light. And I don't know how how much it's hurt. Bud Light, I know it's hurt some, and I don't know how much the lasting effect is going to be, but they're trotting out the stock price as proof of a big, you know, the fact that the Anheuser Busch or InBev rather is stock price is small. And then, yeah, it has stocks go up and stocks go down, guys. Whether this is a permanent loss of market share is still very much to be determined. Mm-hmm. Again, if we're talking about the tactics of the left, the left for years, they would target corporate entities and, you know, in ways that I think were also very inefficient political advertising. But the right is copying that right now. They say they're copying it. They say they're doing what the left is doing. Of course, the main difference is they weren't filming themselves running into targets, grabbing displays and throwing them on the ground. They weren't harassing the people who are working, you know, hourly jobs and have zero, even if you believe the target is somehow seeding middle America with demonic symbols through rainbow colored merch. Those people aren't responsible for that choice. The 1250 an hour worker at target has no responsibility here. The threats of violence and stochastic terrorism are so much greater coming from the right. We have seen month after month of terrifying, terrifying stuff coming from unhinged actors on the right. And they're all being goaded on this path towards radicalization and actual violence by this fairly small but prominent group of conservative content creators, he said, grimacing at the thought of using that word. Yeah, that's what it is. But all of whom are turning huge profits, by the way, talking about this stuff constantly. People like, if you go to say, oh, I don't know, the Quarterings YouTube page, which don't do that. Don't (laughs) unless you have to. Do not do that unless unless you are compelled by law or you've got a masochism kink which I'm not kink shaming, but don't do that. Yeah, no. I'm pulling it up now. Thanks. (laughs) It is just, (laughs) scroll down. It is page after page of 10 minute videos, which is how long they need to be in order for them to be monetized. Um, Just going over every detail of the Bud Light story and now the Target story. And they'll pick some other company next. I don't think the Dodgers one is going to stick. No. No, but they're going to try. As you pointed out, and as Ben Collins pointed out on air, thank you, Ben. They are going to keep doing this forever, mainly because it earns these conservative social media performers money. Right. Tim Poole also talked about this, is that he mentioned the Bud Light, the Dylan Mulvaney thing on, you know, for a quick hit video thing. And within two hours, it had racked up half a million views. And that scares these people something fierce. They've got social media teams that see this and they freak out. That is 
thousands of dollars in, of money in Tim Pool's pocket for mm-hmm. one 10 to 20 minute video that he farts out. Yep. Yeah. Of course he's going to do it again. And, and, you know, his explanation at the time was, well, clearly this is something that my audience is interested in. I didn't think it was that important before, but because my audience is interested in this, uh-huh. I obviously should devote time and resources to my journalistic enterprise covering this. <laughs> <laughs> and he says, well, you know, and he sort of throws off his aside, and, you know, the fact that it's doing so well. Yeah, well, that's uh, that's part of my calculus as well. And it's like, come on. That's why the Daily Wire is doing it. That's why the quartering is doing it. That's why Pool is doing it. That's why Libs of TikTok is doing it. That's why Gaze Against Groomers is doing it. That's why all of these people are doing this. They are raking in cash, screaming about this, and it's a formula that works, so they're going to repeat it. And they don't even have to necessarily leave the house. I mean, some of them, if you're just getting started, you might be the guy who goes into Target and and throws some stuff on the floor. But if you're you're libs of TikTok, you don't ever have to leave your living room. Nope. For any reason. It's just, it's so easy. They have gamified stochastic terrorism. Mm-hmm. It's a mutual feedback loop where they get their listeners at a target in Arizona or Indiana or wherever to go into the store and make a video of themselves being at best a harassing creep and at worst someone who you might need to call the cops on and might actually start to get physical. Because if you watch these videos, and I'd like to think of myself as a decent like judge of what is and what is not a performance of rage and what is actual rage like when say alex stein goes into the target and does a bit about him trying on one of these bathing suits that are designed for for trans women that's acting that's bad acting but that's acting he's an awful actor he's terrible nails on a chalkboard gratingly awful performer but he's performing but when you see some you know doughy middle-aged guy with a handheld camera sort of ranting about the fact that they are they are indoctrinating children. And boy, they these people learn the lines from these content creators by rote. Oh, yes. They oh, can yes. recite oh, yeah. chapter and verse of this stuff. They sound exactly the same. When they talk about indoctrinating children and grooming children, that guy is legitimately angry. Mm-hmm. That, that man is probably getting ignored at family gatherings. That person is sitting home alone a lot of the time. But his rage is in his mind. That's quite real. Yes. And so they make those videos. The press does have to cover them. I disagree with how they've covered it, but they do have to cover it. And then the content and then the content creators, they just slap that video in there, add their commentary, and the whole thing keeps rolling merrily along. Yes. Yeah. And it, it is a turnkey business that they've managed to to put together. Yes. So let me ask you this, both of you guys, say your target, say you're the next business on the hit list, as it were, and you see a campaign like this get started on social media. Your interns come to you and say, guys, we have a huge problem. They are now pointing this at us. How do you handle it? What do you do? Man, I don't know. Um, <laughs> yeah. Jay, what's your solution? I don't think anything they've done so far has worked. Bud Light tried ignoring it. That didn't work. Target no. tried, tried to do a little fence straddling. That didn't seem to work too well. Dodgers caved and then Uncaved. came back to the side of goodness and light. If you give them any sort of inch, it's over. You've lost. It's done. Right. So you're either going to I mean, just prostrate yourself before them and say, please... Oh, right wing content creator, have mercy upon us. If you're going to give in, you give in all the way. And if you're not, you don't at all. Because I think Bud Light, we saw first people kind of rolled their eyes at it. And then I remember Tim Pool talking about this and Don Jr. was talking about, oh, they give so much money to Republicans. Oh, actually, they give more money to Republicans and Democrats. So we shouldn't we shouldn't boycott them. But that didn't work because a lot of these people don't care they don't consider themselves republicans they hate corporations they hate the republican party they might be trump voters they're not republican voters and so they just kept going and eventually anybody on the right who was trying to do the oh they they love republicans gave up because it wasn't working so yeah 
I would like to see what happened if, if a corporate entity, uh, you know, the Widget Corp came out and said, we uh, said, these are our products. Uh, we welcome all shoppers. If you do not like the products that we have for sale in our brick and mortar store or online marketplace or whatever, we you are free to shop somewhere else. Yeah. And I honestly think, yeah, there are concerns about violence. And I think you have to be a big enough corporation where you can defend yourself you can hire security if you need to because it might come to that mm -hmm. yeah it will come to that. it will it will the it amazing thing that jeremy hambly and pool and a few other content creators were saying <laughs> is, sorry i have my my larynx just goes into spasm the minute, the minute i have to say that the minute these reactionary social media performers like whenever they do these kinds of things the thing they say is they're absolutely frothing and giddy at the thought that this is happening they view this they feel like they are winning oh yeah they're winning the game mm -hmm. they are joyous at it and eventually you know the smarter ones have to throw in somewhere the fact that they are getting threats so they first say i don't think it's true they're making it up yeah prove it i, I haven't seen the calls i went to the cops and mm -hmm. the cops wouldn't give it to me yeah totally. uh -huh. whenever someone in the maga right is presented with evidence that in some way <laughs> contradicts their worldview because i think most of them still do understand that violence is bad although we're reaching a point where that's not even true either but most of the ones who try to say semi-respectable especially the ones that are on youtube and need to make need to follow youtube's threadbare content moderation <laughs> guidelines they have to say so first they say it isn't true and then they have to say but you know i just want to say that if we're, you know, uh, keep up the good work, everyone, keep up the protests, uh -huh. keep fighting back. But we don't believe in violence because it's the left that's actually violent. Right. And we don't believe in that. Don't make any threats. That's stupid. Don't do that. Which begs the question, why do you have to tell your audience not to be violent? Especially when you told me two minutes ago that this wasn't actually happening. Yeah. They're not required to solve those those seemingly contradictory points of view, but that's OK. Well, and if it gets really dicey, then we'll just call it a false flag and a psyop. Right. And yeah. It's not really our guy. It's not couldn't possibly be somebody who listens to me. He was listening, ironically, or he's a fed. Real no true Scotsman hours here on the conservative media. Indeed. I don't think there's a good answer to what you do or how you win this, but I really do think you're left with two choices. It is completely given, do exactly what the right wants, beg for mercy. Or you say, yes, these are my products. We are inclusive. We believe in our mission and we're going to keep doing this. Please stand in solidarity with our values. And it's going to get dicey. Mm -hmm. It's going to get scary. And violence is a very real concern. But I I would like to see someone try that. And no one. Definitely. Draw a line in the sand and say no. Because I really, I really do think, I mean, and this is another thing. I mean, all three of us here are terminally online. Sorry. Yes. This is. The brain worms have, have wrapped themselves around our cerebral cortex. Smooth and they are not like go. butter. Right. We are. The mm -hmm. online right is somehow even more afflicted than we are. That remains a minority of the population. We right. are a minority group. Thank God. <laughs> for <now>. Yes. <laughs> and I really do think for most people, if you tell them, that someone is screaming at Target because they're offering a kid's onesie that has a rainbow on it, they're going to look at that person like they're a freak. I really, really do believe that. That is the that's the most optimistic white pill thing <laughs> I have at the moment right now. And I think that most people will just look at them, regardless of their political inf like affiliation. I really do think that it's not the whole, even the whole MAGA right that thinks this way. Well, I think it's worth a try at least because no one's actually, like Jay said, done that. No one's actually come right out and said, you know what? We are being targeted by a weird online harassment campaign and try to ignore some of the weirdness that you're going to see in our stores for the next while because this is a very specific group of extremely loud online people. They'll go away. They'll lose interest. And for those of you online, get bent. We're not yeah. changing anything. It would be interesting to have somebody just call it out like that. That would be a remarkable act of solidarity. I don't have a lot of faith in corporate America to, no, know, no. to make that choice. 
the other interesting thing here to me is going again going back to the 2000s there was a, a great deal of writing and uh research and reporting done on the degree to which the republican party after 9 11 had flipped in its relationship with fox news that whereas in the 90s say during the clinton years Fox News was considered, you know, the communications wing of the Republican Party. And there were there was a symbiotic relationship there. Absolutely. And Fox would never do anything but bolster the Republican message. But by the 2000s, now you suddenly had conservatives who were designing their political messaging and their policy viewpoints around what was on Fox News. Mm -hmm. And that Fox News had taken control of the field. That's been a theory, or even if you want to take it a step further, a pretty proven phenomenon for a long time. The terrifying thing to me now is, is that the Conservative Party is now beholden to the Jeremy Hambleys of the world and the Matt Walsh's of the world and the oh, Lutzes yes. of TikTok. That they are not beholden even to, you know, say like a Sean Hannity, who is a company man through and through. Sean Hannity is not extremely online. Sean Hannity will learn about these things by osmosis, but that's not his world. But you see it. Yeah. Yeah. You see it with the tweets of Ronnie Jackson and Jim Jordan. No, no, no. These people are all now beholden to, in fact, a far more extremist, far more paranoid, far stupider version yeah. of, than Sean Hannity. These people are beholden to Cat Turd. Yes. It's the party of Cat Turd too now. Cat Turd is driving this bus. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And they are people who, for lack of a better word, they are witches. They believe in witchcraft. They believe they're getting hidden messages from the demonic realm as expressed through various corporate logos. That is what has taken absolutely... And you, you see this in Ron DeSantis's, you know, botched presidential <laughs> launch. Like, once, once they got through all the glitches and, and sort of Elon mumbling in the background, like, so too many people here. <laughs> <laughs> you know, once you got through all of that, which hilarious. Mwah, it was amazing. It. No notes, no notes. But once you got past that and actually heard what he said, I mean, he, he, he talking about the woke mind virus all the time or, or, you know, or narrative capture. These are not the kinds of things that normal people can even parse. Yeah. To me, it is extremely terrifying. Look, the actual policy issues of the Republican Party, the you know the the august figures in the Republican Party, the people who are controlling the purse strings of the Republican Party, they remain the same as they they were when the Koch brothers started dumping money into this project back in the eighties. They are they want less regulation, they want to destroy unions, they want lower taxes, and they want to turn it into a libertarian paradise. That right. you know, and the, the occasional foreign war boondoggle thrown in to goose military spending that is the republican project those people right those people knew that to this day those ideas are not very popular mm -hmm. most people do not want that so you know they had to throw some chum at the crazies in order to get them to vote for it right they had to scream about patriotism they had to as barack obama rightly said clutch bibles they had to promise that that the, the scary black man in the White House was coming for their guns. They had to do all these things to get them to vote, right? And But they knew what the reality was. Look, the difference was is that the gray eminences in the 90s and the 2000s were reading the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal, and they had a basic grasp of reality. The problem is the people running the Republican Party now are not just people who have turned a fire hose of Fox News on themselves. They are, as we've been saying, they're reading cat turds posts. Yes. They're listening to Stu Peters. Oh, God. Yep. Right? Yep. <sighs> they think Alex Jones had a few good points here and there. Or he's a visionary. Right. Uh, plenty they of them. Are, the Marjorie Taylor Greens, they are true believers. And the gray eminences are just sort of standing quietly by to the side, sort of, like, you know, drumming their fingers and wondering how much, how much, how much more of this madness they're going to put but like put up with before they can actually just you know just sort of raise the debt ceiling and declare victory yeah unfortunately yeah those those days are gone i think that's not the party that exists anymore 
It is the party, like we've been saying, of Matt Walsh, of Cat Turd, of Tim Pool. That's that's what these people are all about now. And they aren't necessarily concerned with the idea that we have to get a deal done on the debt ceiling or really anything else. For them, it's just MAGA. Right, because they don't think that it'll hurt them. And the only point of being a Republican these days is to inflict harm on someone they see as an other. And right now it's trans and gay people. Mm -hmm. And before that, it was, you know, and it still is black people because the critical race theory is out there poisoning the children. And this entire satanic panic that has been ginned up, the only thing you want, it's like, well, the, the elite want the debt ceiling raised. Why? I don't know. They're spending money. I don't understand it. But if they want it, I will deny it to them because it'll make them hurt. Some other will be hurt by this. And causing a global recession doesn't seem to factor into their thinking. And they honestly don't care. They think, well, maybe I'll pay X dollars more for, for a carton of eggs. But if those people suffer more, then it's worth it for me. And they don't realize, no, actually, it's going to hurt you so much more than the elite will be fine. Yeah. You mm -hmm. will be the one getting a cheese grater run over your inner thigh by this. They get really offended if you say that they vote against their interests, but they're voting or or pushing content that's, that's shit posting. It doesn't. Mm -hmm. None of this helps them. None of this makes their lives not better. Getting Target to hide its trans clothing. How, how does that help you? Right. It's not even, I mean, voting against the, because the conservative movement as a whole, and they did this to themselves. They spent the last, since Nixon, I would say, and if you want to go back to the Birchers, that's fine by me, to, like trying to convince Americans and the Democrats contributed this well by being feckless morons, disabusing them of the notion that the government could actually do anything to make their lives slightly better. And the Democrats proved them right. So way to go, guys. So why would they think that a functioning government could help them? They've seen no evidence of that in their lives. All we're telling them right now is that slightly less pain will be inflicted. And that's not going to get people out of their butts no. to act. Well, and I and I feel like for the influencers, it's it's very simple. They don't care as long as they get theirs and they're getting theirs. So they're going to keep pointing everyone in the direction that gets them more. Tim Pool needs a bigger skate park at his. In a <laughs> crumbling empire, why would anyone believe in the notion that there can be collective action, let alone collective governmental action that improves the day to day quality of their lives? Show me the proof of concept recently. Show me when it's happened. Nope. You can't because it doesn't exist anymore. That's what they're trying to target. No pun intended. It was done in a terrible, half-hearted, capitulating to profit way. The vaccine should have been given to every single person on this planet free of charge. And we could talk about the reasons why that didn't happen. But for God's sake, we did get a vaccine for a completely unknown, mm -hmm. deadly global pandemic in what nine months yes yeah that is a mind-boggling feat yes of human ingenuity Absolutely. and it should have been celebrated but instead a certain percentage of the world and particularly in america thinks it's a plot to in, to implant a microchip into your head somehow they're out to get you by this and and I, and I get it. They are often out to get you, but sometimes they're not. <laughs> and this was one of the absolute most amazing things humans have ever done. But like you said, they took advantage of the pre-existing amount of distrust of the system and the pre-existing amount of anti-vax sentiment and just turned it into one more thing to turn into a culture war wedge issue. Because a guy on anonymous guy on Substack with no medical degree or qualifications whatsoever. Or even a hack with a degree like Steve Kirsch, like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Can make $40,000 a month posting about how COVID-19 is a bioweapon on Substack. So they're going to do it. Of mm -hmm. course they're going to do it. Why not? There's no reason not to if you're them at this point. I mean, they. you're going to find somebody eventually who doesn't care about their soul or doesn't believe they have one. And 
Yeah, the money's good. Or looks around at a kleptocracy and say, everyone else is doing it. Who, what kind of sucker am I not to? Yes. If you want to be a little cynical about it. Absolutely. That's where we seem to be at in 2023, this point in time. And, and we're going to change the name to the Lefty Suckers podcast. Uh, <laughs> here. Did nothing wrong. Seriously. <laughs> Seriously. We're staring around at these goblins and Visigoths seated around a poker table and we're sitting here like you know wistfully rubbing our chin and wondering who the suckers are it's us man yeah i could we could have our very own castle at this point get our own private island somewhere and that's the thing that's hard to get your head around to some extent because you see the people that make a living doing this on that side And then you see the people that make a living doing this on our side. You find yourself thinking, man, at some point, am I just an idiot for not getting in on this? They love apostates. Mm -hmm. They would love. That's why that's why Matt Taibbi is doing bank. That's why Glenn Greenwald is doing bank, because they Mm -hmm. love an apostate. They love a lefty who said who they can look up and say, see, this objective Mm -hmm. observer, this person that you lavished praise upon now has looked at the objective facts and through reasoned argumentation has come to our side. Right. They love that. Live on Rumble. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it doesn't work that way on the left, though. That's the funny part, is that, like, it's a completely different way to look at the world. Like, No, we still look at Bill Crystal and go, mm-hmm. screw you, you bastard. You've got blood on your hands. Liberals welcome the Greenwalds and, and, and will say nice things about Liz Cheney all the time. They will give them like reasonable sinecures in order for doing so. That does exist on, on the liberal side. On the actual left side, we're staring at them and going. Never going to trust you. No. Imagine no. if Tucker came over right now. If Tucker said, guess what? I've seen the light. Glenn Beck tried to pull that. You remember the photo uh-huh. shoot of him dressed like a Williamsburg hipster in the New York Times where he said, and did yes. the article where he was like, whoops, I'm sorry for all that, I think was the headline. Yeah. I think it said whoops. It was, I'm sorry for all that. Yeah. I want to I praise, though. I've come here to praise Glenn Beck, not to bury him. The thing about Glenn Beck that I will always praise is, contra all of the freaks and the lunatics who we've been discussing today, and Glenn was a freaking lunatic, I... As a man of the theater, I appreciated the performances that he crafted on Fox News. So those things were deranged, but <laughs> in their own milieu, they were well executed. Similarly to how I can sort of objectively parse the showmanship of an Alex Jones and say he knows what he is doing when he is crafting a performance. Mm-hmm. He is a masterpiece of absurdist theater, that Glenn Beck. Just. Yes. Yes. The Ibsen of our times. The chalkboards, the puppets, the dangling mobiles. That mm-hmm. was some, that was game recognized game is, is I think how I'll put it. <laughs> Jared Holt mentioned something recently talking about Tim Pool and saying how he's essentially filled the hole that Alex Jones used to to fill on YouTube. He's the same content, but oh my God, it's it's there's no performance. There's no theatrics. There's no, no anything. This is something that that Becca Lewis mentioned to me when I talked when I spoke to her for the first story that I reported on Pool. She said there are in fact two different kinds of YouTube content creators, and they attract different kinds of audience. They are the performers, and there are the mirrors. The performers are people like Alex, like Glenn Beck, like Miley Yiannopoulos was back in when he was, you know, yeah. before he did whatever he's doing to like leech money from. Whoever he's leeching money from now. (laughs) And his endless spats with alleged kid diddlers. Um, (sighs) That there was, that what they're doing is they're creating a narrative world. And they hold a role as the ringmaster or the conductor of this narrative circus. And they will introduce you to their various little hangers on and then, you know, and they'll bring them on. But it is a, it is a dramatic world with an arc. Now, like a sitcom, the story never changes and and they bring on the same characters over and over again. There's no resolution to this narrative of drama. The enemies are forever at the gate and they're also forever triumphant. But that's a kind of a theatrical performance. The mirrors are people who are consciously doing an anti-performance. It is just like we're doing here. 
camera stuck at a face, people in a room talking. It is not crafted as a performance style. But what that appeals to is not people who want to enter into a fictional narrative. That is crafted for people who want to see the best version of themselves reflected back at them. Right. And that's what Poole does. Poole, in the last two years, by the way, has gone way more towards Alex Jones. He has started becoming um, a performer and less of a mirror. But in the the 2017 to 2020 Tim Poole, when I was mainly covering it or researching what he was doing, is he would just sit there and he would talk and he would and he would mirror the fears, anxieties of his audience back to them. And that can be an effective way of creating these kinds of parasocial relationships, which is different from the performer. Because with a performer, you're always, with Alex Jones, everyone who's a fan of his is aware that it's a performance. Right, right. Um, He's even said that. They Court hearings, yes. that this is not real. This is a performance. Court hearings, right. They know that they're watching a show, that the real real Alex Jones, whatever is left of that, is, is a different kind of person. They know that they're watching a show, but they enjoy the show. Right. Um, with and there is a parasocial bond that develops, but it's of a different type than when you think the person who is talking to you on YouTube is your friend and that he's like you or he's like a version of you that you would like to aspire to. So I personally, again, as someone who used to work in the theater, I don't want to see versions of me reflected back at me. It's hard enough to look at my own reflection some morning. So I, I like a nice performance. I can I can appreciate theatricality and acting styles. So... Um, but Tim's getting, Tim is really, the apocalyptic language comes more and more readily these days and mm-hmm. as with like the thunder and brimstone cut triumphalism about complete and total victory over the bug hordes that are trying to destroy him. Well, it's, it's getting to the point and, and I do read his tweets and I don't watch or listen to every show, but I still listen to it a couple a week and it, it just, I I don't find it hard to imagine him sitting on his porch at night, just waiting for the bombs to go off. Mm-hmm. Well, he's already moved into his compound. He's already got his like survivalist nest out in West Virginia. If he's not, he's not just there at the compound. There are multiple compounds. Ooh. He owns multiple properties in West Virginia. Um, and he is, as he has said on air, that place is armed to the teeth. Oh, I'm sure. That place is that place. He has mentioned this repeatedly in episodes that there are, Lots of, in addition to Poole's own personal cache of weapons, there are, in fact, armed security personnel on grounds. And he, that's, that is another weird part of Poole's arc, if we're going to get into some Poole lore, is that all he has done is get more and more scared of the world around him and move further and further away from cities. And as he's done so, strapped more and more guns and high-grade weapons to his chest and now he's got a fortified compound i think it's fair to say mm-hmm. he, he was in new york and this was while he was still working at fusion the origin story that he tells there is there was a shooting on his block of two cops in bed um and that was it for him he had to leave new york so he crosses <laughs> and the bridge goes to north jersey and then later he moved to like a place in, in further south, closer to Philly. But then in 2020, the Black Lives Matter protests were coming over the river into this sleepy Philly suburb. And so he had to get out of there. <laughs> it's like, you left New York because two cops got shot? That was it? That's what made you leave? This is 2014 New York. Crime was still going down at that point. And it right. had been going down for 15 years one cop shooting and you're like that's it i'm gone they're coming to get me and and i think in tim pool's world it's fairly clear who the they are is coming to get you oh, because yes. it was a black guy who shot those two cops and then it was the black lives matter poster he has been running from the brown hordes for the past decade now he's at the end of the road he's got an armed compound and now he's there. I don't think the woke is going to infect West Virginia anytime soon. So he should be. No, no, no. I mean, I would I would say the only place further he could go is like actually into the caves. But who's to say he hasn't already? Let's be honest. Weird little white nationalist enclave sort of 
uh, getting together in that part of West Virginia also. Peter Brimelow's right, the castle, Air castle is now under investigation by the IRS for, <laughs> for violating nonprofit laws is, is situated there. Womp, uh, womp. Cassandra yeah. Fairbanks's uh, pad is within, I think, 30 minutes of that place. There are a lot of white nationalists amassing in West Virginia. Here's something I I am curious about Temple. Is there any indication that he is in a relationship or has recently been in any place? His girlfriend works as his, uh, I believe her title is COO of Timcast Media Group. Uh-huh. Okay, that's the name, yeah. He has a girlfriend. Uh, uh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Good yeah. for, good for I, him. I, like, good for him. Uh, I'll, I'll save my reporting and say that this is something I reported in my first story, um, is that, you know, a lot of the sources that I spoke to felt that Tim had issues with women. There is, of course, you know, the clip that's been made around for a long time where he's talking about in 2019, where I think where he's talking about the fact that he can't, he doesn't have family yet. Um, and... And he says famously, like, talking about dating, he goes, I don't think the, the reason I don't have a, like, he's talking about, well, my dad, by my age, had already had two kids, and, and I don't, and I'm not in a relationship. And he goes, but I don't think the problem is me. I think it's everybody else. <laughs> yeah, my curiosity is is piqued because I, I am just wondering, he's got this secure compound up there, and what is he doing to alleviate the declining white birth rates don't want to discuss that. <laughs> 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 I, I will say that on air he has just like that he, he has noted the fact that he talks constantly which is a straight up white nationalist talking point that the best thing you can do to save the american republic is to procreate mm-hmm. and he clearly gets shit from his fans for the fact that he himself is 37 now and has no children so why aren't you living your truth brother mm-hmm. his response has been we're working on it but he does in fact have okay. a girlfriend okay. or at least as recently as the story that i've done the last story that did on him which i think was about seven or eight months ago i think he he did say that he is still dating the woman who is running his company which is a i can't foresee any problems there <laughs> no. <laughs> no, no. It does sound like he's been listening to Pasovic uh a little too much there if he's if he's getting into that great replacement stuff, but it's paying the bills for him. Look, right now, circa 2023, it's Tim Pool's main force of rhetoric, aside from the apocalyptic, the civil war is coming, the civil war is always here stuff, is that Everyone should flee the cities, move to some rural enclave, raise chickens, become self-sufficient, and procreate. And that is this, and separate themselves from the woke mind virus. Separate mm-hmm. themselves from the, this evil indoctrination. Which, by the way, sounds like he's calling for a civil war, which he constantly denies, but he is. But that is white nationalist accelerationist rhetoric to a T. Mm-hmm. Right. To me, the greatest rebuttal to Tim's whole, well, I'm just a centrist. I'm like, Tim, your ideas are the same as Jared Taylor's. Your ideas are the same as Peter Brimelow's. You can be a person of color. And what you are espousing, whether you realize it or not, or again, you've just been hanging around with, you know, Pasovic and Eli Schaefer for so long that you don't even realize it. But you are mirroring white nationalist rhetoric right now. Yes. No, and I don't know how much they think about it. Or or realize it or care. No, they don't. They don't. They don't. They don't. They don't have time to think about these things. They got another uh, YouTube video to put out mm-hmm. and a live stream to broadcast. And, and yep. And there's always another YouTube video or a live stream because they've got to keep the money coming in. The show has to go on, man. Indeed. The mm-hmm. show will keep rolling merrily, merrily along, unless not to sound like some kind of stinking commie bastard. Someone does something about the means of production and realizes that we are pumping <laughs> garbage into our veins 24 seven. And that it, that if you remove the profit motive, you maybe can put a spike in some of this stuff. Well, and I don't, I don't see what else there is that can be done unless you take away the money, take away the profit. It's too easy. Mm-hmm. It's too easy. They don't even have to leave their homes and they get filthy rich and they don't care who gets hurt in the process because they, well, somebody's going to get hurt anyway, so I may as well get mine. They're not going to stop. Unless you take the money away, they're never going to stop. 
This may not sound it, but here's another white filled thought. Socialism and barbarism are both on the menu, but they're also both on the ascent. Uh, yeah. Pick one. Yeah. We are in, I don't know if it's an eternal struggle, but it is an unfinished, ongoing struggle. More so than any point in my lifetime, it has brought this conflict into a much sharper focus in America than it has been in a very long time. Which way, American? Thanks for listening to the Did Nothing Wrong podcast. If you want to hear more, you can go to didnothingwrongpod.com. You can also follow us on Twitter at James, the word four, and the letter M, all one word, and Grizza, B-J-J, G-R-Z-A, B-J-J, as well as D-N-W pod. Thanks again for tuning in. And remember, everyone mentioned did nothing wrong.